Merci. Ah, parfait. So there are 9 billion species out there. Do you think that we humans are the most intelligent one? Theodore Monon, who was a great French biologist and a philosopher, wrote that what makes us different from other organisms is not our intelligence. As we will see during this talk, other organisms are as intelligent, if, even, if not even more, than we are. And Franz Deval, who is a biologist who studies animal behaviors, wrote a book to make a point, and he entitled it, Are We, too, are we Smart Enough to Understand Animal Intelligence? What makes us different from other organisms is our ability to question things, to want to know why, And you see that very early on in kids. They question everything, all the time. And I'm sure many of you either have that kid at your home, or were that kid, or maybe still are. So, you know, kids question things like, why sky is blue? And as parents, we know that that one's coming, so we prepare, you know, we learn an answer. But then they also question why zebras have stripes. And it turned out that even the scientific community did not have an answer to that one until 2015. It turned out that zebra stripes are a cooling mechanism. You see, the, the black stripes absorb more heat than the white stripes. So the, wool, the, the air is hotter around the black stripes and cooler on the white stripes. This creates the difference in airflow that cools the animal down without a ventilator. Now, I'm a biologist, and my job is to question why everything in nature is the way it is, the way we see it. And I grew up in a city, so my, my passion for biology came more from naturalist books that I was reading as a kid. And the true biologist really got unleashed when I started going to the field trips as a student at the university. And this was um, the place where I did my first field trip, very ordinary forest near Zagreb in Croatia, where I was doing my studies. We discovered one dead salamander and frog eggs. It was nothing exceptional, but I was amazed I spent the whole day breathing fresh autumn air. My knees were muddy, my hands were muddy, and I was looking at how life gives birth and how it dies. And from there on, I just continued doing experiments. So during the week, I was uh, raising butterfly eggs in my student dorm room. It was like a two by three meter room. My sister was crazy about this. But I wanted to see how butterflies go from an egg to a caterpillar to a flying insect. And my weekends, I was spending them catching dragonflies. Because I was amazed by their colors. Look at that eyes. And also by their ability to fly. And I was even spending some of my summer holidays Uh, observing the, the colonization of dead mouse bodies by the insects. Because biology was the future of forensics, and by observing at which time point, which insect was present on the dead body, you can determine the time of that. Now, finally, uh, it all culminated with me actually doing a real science PhD in biology. And the question I decided to, to focus on was the one of why some organisms compete while others cooperate. And I was so intrigued by this question because as a biology student, you learn that organisms compete, then there is a selection, and you know, this is how natural selection works, and the strongest ones survive. And even Darwin, who is the father of evolutionary theory, was puzzled 
by social behaviors. He wrote a whole chapter on, you know, these ants, they cooperate, I don't really understand what's going on, it does not completely fit my theory always. So I started looking at how biologists were explaining social behaviors. And I was surprised by the fact that they were using economical models to do so. So mathematical models developed by economists to understand what does it pay off for us humans to engage in cooperation and when does it pay off for us to be competitive. The same models were used on bacteria, on insects, on birds and on chimpanzees. And it turned out they worked even better, because you know, we, might, we humans act from emotions lots of times. And that's one thing mathematicians did not know how to put in an equation. So mathematically, it was the same whether you were uh, bacteria, insect or human. We were all solving the same equations. And it turned out that that was not only the case for social behaviors and economics, it was the case for everything. Because you see, we all live on this one planet. And the laws of physics, the laws of chemistry, and the laws of mathematics are the same for everybody. It doesn't matter if you are a bird or a man-made drone. The physics of flight is the same. And it did not matter if you were a tree that wanted to bring water all the way from the roots, 100 meter high, to its leaves. Or if you were an engineer, and you need to bring water to the third floor of your building. You know, the water is the same. The gravity that you are going against is the same. It just turned out that plants were doing it with zero amount of energy. Passive prothesis, 100 meter high. And we were using big pumps to do so. And, that, and all of that meant something very powerful. It meant that we were not the first ones to ask these questions. You know, how to fly, how to bring water against gravity, how to make materials. And it also meant that we were not the only ones having a solution. It actually turned out that we were the last ones. And then simply because evolutionary, we are the youngest species. So if you would put evolution of life on a scale of a day, just to be able to grasp it a bit better, we can see that life appeared early morning. That's 3.8 billion years ago. Photosynthesis arrived in the, around the noon. You know, and while oxygen was toxic at the beginning in the atmosphere, it permitted the evolution of more efficient metabolic pathways that that made, the evolution, but that made the pathway to the evolution of complex life forms. You have sponges, worms, fish that arrived in the afternoon for tea. Dinosaurs arrived in the evening. They stayed on this planet for one hour before they went extinct because a meteorite hit the planet Earth. Most of the life complex animal forms that you see like the mammals, arrived around 11 in the evening. And then one second before midnight, we humans arrived. Just one second. That's a blink of an eye and we're, it's over. And you know, it seems that life has been solving problems the whole day. But we, and well, we just started to play with them for the last one second. Biomimicry is a field that looks at the physics of chemistry, mathematics of life, and then transfers all of that knowledge to our human problem solving. And because nature is sustainable almost by definition, these are all solutions, sustainable solutions to life on planet Earth. And you know, then these nine billion species become that books of knowledge. And we just need to start learning from them. 
And then you will have zebra stripes that become passive cooling mechanisms for buildings. Or diatoms and bones, they become the reference book for building lightweight structures. You have desert beetles that teach us how to capture air, how to capture water from air, and then feed that to populations in arid regions. Dragonflies that I was studying all my weekends become the experts of flight. Because, you know, they have been flying every day for the last 300 million years. Now, we've been doing it successfully for the last 100 years. That's nothing. And plants teach us how to make solar cells. But the ones that take CO2 out of the atmosphere and give oxygen back. Because, you know, in plants, for plants, CO2 is a resource and oxygen is waste. Imagine if life would treat oxygen as, as we treat waste. Life would not evolve in a form that it evolved today. S scientists and engineers all over the world have now started to recognize the elegance of nature solutions and then transfer that to our human problem solving. But you know, I was an evolutionary biologist uh, studying cooperative behaviors. And I wanted to know if, if other organisms can teach us something about being more social. And I found this especially interesting in these times when we feel more divided than ever, when we feel more self-centered than ever, and when more than ever we are disconnected from others around us and the natural world. So I studied amoebas. They're called Dictyostelium discoideum, and they're also called social amoeba. And they live in soil or all around us. So if you go out there in your background, you will for sure find some. And what's extremely interesting about them is that when there is no more food, so when the cells eat all of bacteria that's in the soil, millions of cells come together. This is whole Paris coming together to make this mushroom-like structure. And what mushrooms, this, this structure permits to cells, it lifts them above the ground and it helps them disperse. No? So it disperse much more easier if you are here than if you're on the ground. But it comes at the cost. You see, the cells that built this next structure, they need to die. And this is 20% of the population. See, here you have 200,000 cells dying to increase the survival of 800,000 other ones. This is how nature cooperates. This is what means to be social in nature. And so while I was looking at these organisms every day, I realized that they, they, they know so much more than us what being social means. And I would like to share with you two lessons that I learned from these organisms. The first one is really going back to what does it mean to be social. Now, I don't think that we should all die for our neighbors. I lived through a war in ex-Yugoslavia in the 90s, and I think that violence is the worst solution to any problem. What I do think that these organisms can teach us and what all the other social organisms do is that in order to be social, you need to align your interests with the greater interests of the group. So for, and, and you know, amoebas do so because they all agree that there is no more food where they are, where they need to move at some other place, and evolution has taught them that the best way to do that is to build a mushroom, even at the cost. So they have all of their priorities and uh, interests aligned. 
But what does that mean for us humans? It means that we need to start, stop only thinking about our own short-term immediate pleasures and start acting for the benefits of the group. Now, I was a biology student at that time, and I really wanted to learn, you know, how can I start applying this now? So I, I made the phrase a bit simpler. I said, OK, Daria, you need to start doing not only what's good for you, but what's good for you and, and the others. And I still remember my first step. I said, OK, now I'll start acting. Was I went and I bought fair trade chocolate. Because I decided that if I, can, I should enjoy, if I will enjoy this chocolate, I want to know that people who made it enjoy it as well. And then my second step was every time I was taking a transport or a plane, because I do travel a lot, I tried to pay for carbon neutralization. Because, you know, we only have one atmosphere. No, let's, let's keep it alive together. And then the second step, I started feeling happy about paying taxes. Now, that was the point where everybody around me thought that I was going crazy. No, but I continued running a marathon, and for the last five years, I was running this, I'm running this marathon. And you know what, what's amazing about this? I feel engaged. I feel social. Now, I think that we should all start doing, you know, what's within our power and what's within our community, what's good for our communities. But start thinking, you know, before acting. What's good not only for me, but for me and the others. Hmm? that act from that place. The second lesson is what happens when a social organism stops being social. Now, you can say, oh, this stuff's not for me, helping others not my thing, prefer sticking to my own self-interest, and I seem to be doing quite fine doing that. You know, there are people who think like that, and it will turn out it, it's for a reason. But you know, there is amoebas who think like that. These amoebas don't contribute to the, to the next structure, but only go up in the head where they have 100% chances of survival. And it turns out that short term, this is the best strategy that you can do. Because, you know, you don't pay any cost of being part of the group, but you take all the benefits. It pays off. It's, it's smart in a way. But research on amoebas and, and this valid for other social systems shows that presence of these cells leads to collapse of the group, almost extinction of the social behavior, and then next time starvation will come. All cells will die, even the, even the, the cheating cells. And so we scientists call them cheaters. And that's sadly because they resemble a lot of human behaviors. And as a biologist looking at, at our human systems, I realized that we do everything to enrich and to kind of make the pathway for these cheaters. You know, we encourage short-term maximization of profit, two years return on investment, do things cheaper, even if it means polluting the environment. Now, when I, when I speak to people that do sustainable uh, solutions, they, they, they tell me, if only they would give us five-year return on investment. I think we all need to engage a bit more and, and leave more space for engaged social behaviors and not only short-term cheating behaviors, as we call it in biology. Now, I, I think that all biologists or sociologists and all psychologists agree that we humans are a social species. And there is no economical system and there is no political system that will take that away from us. And I feel that the humanitarian and climate crisis that we are facing today is not the one of technological advancement but one of us losing our sociality. And nature seems to know all the answers to how to fix that. You know, from how to make things differently to how to manage social systems. And our human intelligence is not in doing better than nature. 
That's our human ego. Our intelligence is in working with the nature. And you don't need to be a biologist to do so. I think that we should all just start observing a bit more these time giants that are around us. And next time, you're faced with a problem. Don't jump straight away to a human-centered way of thinking, but ask yourself, how did nature already solve this? And then play with nature. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Daria.